Chapter Nineteen, Part One of the Memoirs of Jack Casanova, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joelle Peebles. The Memoirs of Jack Casanova, Volume Two, Paris in Prison, by Giacomo Casanova, translated by Arthur Machen. Episode Eight. Convent Affairs. Chapter 19. Part 1. I give my portrait to M. M., a present from her. I go to the opera with her. She plays at the faro table and replenishes my empty purse. Philosophical conversation with M. M. A letter from C. C. She knows all. A ball at the convent. My exploits in the character of Pierrot. My dear M. M. had expressed a wish to have my portrait, something like the one I had given to C. C., only larger, to wear it as a locket. The outside was to represent some saint, and an invisible spring was to remove the sainted picture and expose my likeness. I called upon the artist who had painted the other miniature for me, and in three sittings I had what I wanted. He afterwards made me an annunciation in which the angel Gabriel was transformed into a dark-haired saint, and the holy virgin into a beautiful light-complexioned woman holding her arms towards the angel. The celebrated painter Mengs imitated that idea in the picture of the Annunciation which he painted in Madrid twelve years afterwards, but I do not know whether he had the same reasons for it as my painter. That allegory was exactly the same size as my portrait, and the jeweller who made the locket arranged it in such a manner that no one could suppose the sacred image to be there only for the sake of hiding a profane likeness. The end of January, 1754, before going to the casino, I called upon Laura to give her a letter for C.C., and she handed me one from her which amused me. My beautiful nun had initiated that young girl not only into the mysteries of Sappho, but also in high metaphysics, and C.C. had consequently become a free thinker. She wrote to me that, objecting to give an account of her affairs to her confessor, and yet not wishing to tell him falsehoods, she had made up her mind to tell him nothing. He has remarked, she added, that perhaps I do not confess anything to him, because I did not examine my conscience sufficiently, and I answered him that I had nothing to say, but a that if he liked, I would commit a few sins for the purpose of having something to tell him in confession. I thought this reply worthy of a thorough sophist, and laughed heartily. On the same day I received the following letter from my adorable nun. I write to you from my bed, dearest Brownie, because I cannot remain standing on my feet. I am almost dead, but I am not anxious about it. A little rest will make me all right, for I eat well and sleep soundly. You have made me very happy by writing to me that your bleeding has not had any evil consequences, and I give you fair notice that I shall have the proof of it on Twelfth Night, at least if you like. That is understood, and you will let me know. In case you should feel disposed to grant me that favor, my darling, I wish to go to the opera. At all events, recollect that I positively forbid the whites of eggs for the future, for I would rather have a little less enjoyment and more security respecting your health. In future, when you go to the casino of Murin, please to inquire whether there is anybody there, and if you receive an affirmative answer, go away. My friend will do the same. In that manner, you will not run the risk of meeting one another. But you need not observe these precautions for long, if you wish, for my friend is extremely fond of you, and has a great desire to make your acquaintance. He has told me that, if he had not seen it with his own eyes, he never would have believed that a man could run the race that you ran so splendidly the other night. But he says that, by making love in that manner, you bid defiance to death, for he is certain that the blood you lost comes from the brain. But what will he say when he hears that you only laugh at the occurrence? I am going to make you very merry. He wants to eat the salad of whites of eggs, and he wants me to ask you for some of your vinegar, because there is none in Venice." He said that he spent a delightful night, in spite of his fear of the evil consequences of our amorous sport, and he has found my own efforts superior to the usual weakness of my sex. That may be the case, dearest Brownie, but I am delighted to have done such wonders, and to have made such trial of my strength. Without you, darling of my heart, I should have lived without knowing myself, 
and I wonder whether it is possible for nature to create a woman who could remain insensible in your arms, or rather one who would not receive new life by your side. It is more than love that I feel for you, it is idolatry, and my mouth, longing to meet yours, sends forth thousands of kisses which are wasted in the air. I am panting for your divine portrait, so as to quench by a sweet illusion the fire which devours my amorous lips. I trust my likeness will prove equally dear to you, for it seems to me that nature has created us for one another, and I curse the fatal instant in which I raised an invincible barrier between us. You will find enclosed the key of my bureau. Open it and take a parcel on which you will see written, For my darling. It is a small present which my friend wishes me to offer you in exchange for the beautiful nightcap that you gave me. Adieu. The small key enclosed in the letter belonged to a bureau in the boudoir. Anxious to know the nature of the present that she could offer me at the instance of her friend, I opened the bureau and found a parcel containing a letter and a Morocco leather case. The letter was as follows. That which will, I hope, render this present dear to you is the portrait of a woman who adores you. Our friend had two of them, but the great friendship he entertains towards you has given him the happy idea of disposing of one in your favor. This box contains two portraits of me which are to be seen in two different ways. If you take off the bottom part of the case in its length, you will see me as a nun. If you press on the corner, the top will open and expose me to your sight in a state of nature. It is not possible, dearest, that a woman can ever have loved you as I do. Our friend excites my passion by the flattering opinion that he entertains of you. I cannot decide whether I am more fortunate in my friend or in my lover, for I could not imagine any being superior to either one or the other. The case contained a gold snuff-box, and a small quantity of Spanish snuff which had been left in it proved that it had been used. I followed the instructions given in the letter, and I first saw my mistress in the costume of a nun standing and in half profile the second secret spring brought her before my eyes entirely naked lying on a mattress of black satin in the position of the madeline of correggio she was looking at love who had the quiver at his feet and was gracefully sitting on the nun's robes it was such a beautiful present that i did not think myself worthy of it i wrote to m m a letter in which the deepest gratitude was blended with the most exalted love the drawers of the bureau contained all her diamonds and four purses full of sequins. I admired her noble confidence in me. I locked the bureau, leaving everything undisturbed, and returned to Venice. If I had been able to escape out of the capricious clutches of fortune by giving up gambling, my happiness would have been complete. My own portrait was set with rare perfection, and as it was arranged to be worn round the neck, I attached it to six yards of Venetian chain, which made it a very handsome present. The secret was in the ring to which it was suspended, and it was very difficult to discover it. To make the spring work and expose my likeness, it was necessary to pull the ring with some force, and in a peculiar manner. Otherwise nothing could be seen but the Annunciation, and it was then a beautiful ornament for a nun. On twelfth night, having the locket and chain in my pocket, I went early in the evening to watch near the fine statue erected to the hero Colleone, after he had been poisoned, if history does not deceive us. Sit divus modo non vivus is a sentence from the enlightened monarch which will last as long as there are monarchs on earth. At six o'clock precisely my mistress alighted from the gondola, well dressed and well masked, but this time in the garb of a woman. We went to the St. Samuel Opera, and after the second ballet we repaired to the Ridotto, where she amused herself by looking at all the ladies of the nobility who alone had the right to walk about without masks. After rambling about for half an hour we entered the hall where the bank was held. She stopped before the table of Monsieur Mosenigo, who at that time was the best amongst all the noble gamblers. As nobody was playing, he was carelessly whispering to a masked lady, whom I recognized as Madame Marina Pitani, whose adorer he was. M. M. inquired whether I wanted to play, and as I answered in the negative, she said to me, I take you for my partner. And without waiting for my answer, she took a purse and placed a pile of gold on a card. The banker, without disturbing himself, shuffled the cards, turned them up, and my friend won the parole. 
the banker paid took another pack of cards and continued his conversation with his lady showing complete indifference for four hundred sequins in which my friend had already placed on the same card the banker continuing his conversations m m said to me in excellent french our stakes are not high enough to interest this gentleman let us go i took up the gold which i put in my pocket without answering m de mocenigo who said to me your mask is too exacting i rejoined my lovely gambler who was surrounded we stopped soon afterwards before the bank of m pierre marcello a charming young man who had near him madame venier sister of the patrician momolo my mistress began to play and lost five rouleaus of gold one after the other having no more money she took handfuls of gold from my pocket and in four or five deals she broke the bank she went away and the noble banker bowing complimented her upon her good fortune after i had taken care of all the gold she had won i gave her my arm and we left the ridotto but remarking that a few inquisitive persons were following us i took a gondola which landed us according to my instructions one can always escape prying eyes in this way in venice after supper i counted our winnings and i found myself in possession of one thousand sequins as my share i rolled the remainder in paper and my friend asked me to put it in her bureau i then took my locket and threw it over her neck it gave her the greatest delight and she tried for a long time to discover the secret at last i showed it to her and she pronounced my portrait in excellent likeness recollecting that we had but three hours to devote to the pleasures of love i entreated her to allow me to turn them to good account yes she said but be prudent for our friend pretends that you might die on the spot and why does he not fear the same danger for you when your ecstasies are in reality much more frequent than mine he says that the liquor distilled by us women does not come from the brain as is the case with men and that the generating parts of woman have no contact with her intellect the consequence of it he says is that the child is not the offspring of the mother as far as the brain the seat of reason is concerned but of the father and it seems to me very true in that important act the woman has scarcely the amount of reason that she is in need of and she cannot have any left to enable her to give a dose to the being she is generating your friend is a very learned man but do you know that such a way of arguing opens my eyes singularly it is evident that if that system be true women ought to be forgiven for all the follies which they commit on account of love whilst man is inexcusable i should be in despair if i happened to place you in a position to become a mother i shall know before long and if it should be the case so much the better my mind is made up and my decision taken and what is that decision to abandon my destiny entirely to you both i am quite certain that neither one nor the other would let me remain at the convent it would be a fatal event which would decide our future destinies i would carry you off and take you to england to marry you my friend thinks that a physician might be bought who under the pretext of some disease of his own invention would prescribe to me to go somewhere to drink the waters a permission which the bishop might grant at the watering place i would get cured and come back here but i would much rather unite our destinies forever tell me dearest could you manage to live anywhere as comfortably as you do here alas my love no but with you how could i be unhappy but we will resume that subject whenever it may be necessary let us go to bed yes if i have a son my friend wishes to act towards him as a father would he believe himself to be the father you might both of you believe it but some likeness would soon enlighten me as to which of you two was the true father yes if for instance the child composed poetry then you would suppose that he was the son of your friend how do you know that my friend can write poetry admit that he is the author of the six lines which you wrote in answer to mine i cannot possibly admit such a falsehood because good or bad they were of my own making and so as to leave you no doubt let me convince you of it at once oh never mind i believe you and let us go to bed or love will call out the god of parnassus let him do it but take this pencil and write i am apollo you may be love je ne me betray pas je te cede la place si venus est ma soeur l'amour est de ma race je sais faire des vers un instant de perdu 
n'enfonce pas l'amour si je l'ai convaincu it is on my knees that i entreat your pardon my heavenly friend but how could i expect so much talent in a young daughter of venice only twenty-two years of age and above all brought up in a convent i have a most insatiate desire to prove myself more and more worthy of you did you think i was prudent at the gaming-table prudent enough to make the most intrepid banker tremble i do not always play so well but i had taken you as a partner and i felt i could set fortune at defiance why would you not play because i had lost four thousand sequins last week and i was without money but i shall play to-morrow and fortune will smile upon me in the meantime here is a small book which i have brought from your boudoir the postures of pietro aretino i want to try some of them the thought is worthy of you but some of these positions could not be executed and others are insipid true but i have chosen ve four very interesting ones these delightful labors occupied the remainder of the night until the alarm warned us that it was time to part. I accompanied my lovely nun as far as her gondola, and then went to bed. But I could not sleep. I got up in order to go and pay a few small debts, for one of the greatest pleasures that a spendthrift can enjoy is, in my opinion, to discharge certain liabilities. The gold won by my mistress proved lucky for me, for I did not pass a single day of the carnival without winning. Three days after Twelfth Night, having paid a visit to the casino of Murren for the purpose of placing some gold in M. M.'s bureau, the doorkeeper handed me a letter from my nun. Laura had, a few minutes before, delivered me one from C. C. My new mistress, after giving me an account of her health, requested me to inquire from my jeweller whether he had not by chance made a ring having on its bezel a St. Catherine, which, without a doubt, concealed another portrait she wished to know the secret of that ring a young boarder she added a lovely girl and my friend is the owner of that ring there must be a secret but she does not know it i answered that i would do what she wished but here is the letter of c c it was rather amusing because it placed me in a regular dilemma it bore a late date but the letter of m m had been written two days before it ali how truly happy i am my beloved husband you love sister M. M., my dear friend. She has a locket as big as a ring, and she cannot have received it from any one but you. I am certain that your dear likeness is to be found under the Annunciation. I recognize the style of the artist, and it is certainly the same who painted the locket and my ring. I am satisfied that sister M. M. has received that present from you. I am so pleased to know all that I would not run the risk of grieving her by telling her that I knew her secret but my dear friend, either more open or more curious, has not imitated my reserve. She told me that she had no doubt of my St. Catherine concealing the portrait of my lover. Unable to say anything better, I told her that the ring was in reality a gift from my lover, but that I had no idea of his portrait being concealed inside of it. If it is as you say, observed M. M., and if you have no objection, I will try to find out the secret, and afterwards I will let you know mine. Being quite certain that she would not discover it, I gave her my ring, saying that, if she could find out the secret, I should be very much pleased. Just at that moment my aunt paid me a visit, and I left my ring in the hands of M. M., who returned it to me after dinner, assuring me that, although she had not been able to find out the secret, she was certain there was one. I promise you that she shall never hear anything about it from me, because if she saw your portrait, she would guess everything, and then I would have to tell her who you are. I am sorry to be compelled to conceal anything from her, but I am very glad you love one another. I pity you both, however, with all my heart, because I know that you are obliged to make love through a grating in that horrid parlour. How I wish, dearest, I could give you my place. I would make two persons happy at the same time. Adieu. I answered that she had guessed rightly, that the locket of her friend was a present from me and contained my likeness but that she was to keep the secret, and to be certain that my friendship for M. M. interfered in no way with the feeling which bound me to her for ever. I certainly was well aware that I was not behaving in a straightforward manner, but I endeavoured to deceive myself. So true it is that a woman, weak as she is, has more influence by the feeling she inspires than man can possibly have with all his strength. At all events, I was foolishly trying to keep up an intrigue which I knew to be near its denouement through the intimacy that had sprung up between these two f 
friendly rivals. Laura, having informed me that there was to be on a certain day a ball in the large parlour of the convent, I made up my mind to attend it in such a disguise that my two friends could not recognise me. I decided upon the costume of a pirogue, because it conceals the form and the gait better than any other. I was certain that my two friends would be behind the grating, and that it would afford me the pleasant opportunity of seeing them together and of comparing them. In Venice, during the carnival, that innocent pleasure is allowed in convents. The guests dance in the parlour, and the sisters remain behind the grating, enjoying the sight of the ball, which is over by sunset. Then all the guests retire, and the poor nuns are for a long time happy in the recollection of the pleasure enjoyed by their eyes. The ball was to take place in the afternoon of the day appointed for my meeting with M. M. in the evening, at the Casino of Murin, but that could not prevent me from going to the ball. Besides, I wanted to see my dear C. C. I have said before that the dress of a Pierrot is the costume which disguises the figure and the gait most completely. It has also the advantage, through a large cap, of concealing the hair, and the white gauze which covers the face does not allow the color of the eyes or of the eyebrows to be seen. But in order to prevent the costume from hindering the movements of the mask, he must not wear anything underneath and in winter a dress made of light calico is not particularly agreeable. I did not, however, pay any attention to that, and taking only a plate of soup, I went to Murin in a gondola. I had no cloak, and in my pockets I had nothing but my handkerchief, my purse, and the key of the casino. End of chapter 19, part 1. Recording by Joelle Peebles.